We welcome Dr. Farber. Um, he is an associate professor here at the University of Washington, and you have his bio in front of you. Dr. Farber will be talking to you about something a little bit different, and, and something that certainly did not exist when I was a medical student, and that was the idea of palliative care, the idea of death. Everything in medicine, when I was a medical student, seemed to be related to curing diseases or to try to do that. We never paid much attention to prevention, and we never paid much attention to the end of life. We sort of tried to take that away from our minds. And he concentrates on that. Uh, he, he runs uh, medical student programs on the issue of palliative care and, and issues related to death. And the one thing he has that no other speaker that has talked to you tonight, today, any time in many meds has, is that 100% of us are going to be sort of patients of his expertise. You're stealing my lines. It mine? Yeah, you're stealing my oh, lines. Oh, that one. I didn't know that was your line. I just thought. And another person's going to get assaulting you here. All right. Minute. OK, all right. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I will try to also give plenty of time for questions. And we'll actually try to engage you a little bit during the conversation. I'm here to tell you that we've been doing studies on mortality here at the University of Washington. How many people here are voting in, and are planning on immortality? <laughs> OK. Well, you might be planning on it, but the odds are pretty slim on that one. <laughs> at some point, you, we'll all discuss either for ourselves or people we love about the end of life. And I'm going to spend some time approaching that and seeing how we might do that in a, reason, in a way that might be more humane and more effective. But before I do that, I'd like to set a little bit of a context. And the first thing is most of what I share with you today is a combination of research, actually going out and talking to clinicians, patients, and families, but even more, the, what I've learned from the greatest teachers I've had in medicine, and those are the patients and families that I've had the privilege to serve. And I expect tonight that I will continue to learn from you, and hopefully I'll be also able to uh, share something that'll be of value to you. Followed in what I'm gonna share tonight by master clinicians, people like Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Pellegrini, who I've learned from, but not just doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains and other professionals who I've had the privilege to work with. The other thing I just want to emphasize is that this is an area which we are beginning to develop programs to teach healthcare professionals, not just doctors, but nurses and social workers. And that there are programs both in the, uh, for medical students, for residents uh, in this area, and that uh, I have the privilege of being part of a chronic care clerkship that will start this July. That will, the, where I'm the content expert for palliative care. There's a palliative care consult service that will uh, become uh, active in the medical center in July. There are a lot of things to help both with service and education that we're really dedicated to. Now, as we go forward here, I'd like to share a quote from the Institute of Medicine. It's a very prestigious group. And they did a study, a report on approaching death in 1997. And one of their conclusions is that people in this country have not learned how to talk realistically and comfortably about the end of life. So we're going to see if we can do that in the next half hour or 40 minutes. We'll see, you let me know at the end how it goes. I'm going to frame this with a real case, a case that I was involved in. And I want you to, first I'll discuss this. We'll come back to this case later. This, just imagine a 56-year-old professional woman with a past history three years ago of being diagnosed with ovarian cancer at stage four, which to define would be all over her internal abdomen. Um, she had very arduous and aggressive treatment three years ago with radiation therapy, surgery and chemotherapy, and had a miraculous response and had a sustained, excellent remission. Two weeks prior to coming to see me, she went to her family doctor for a routine exam and was found to have a recurrence, even though she felt very well. She went to see her gynecologist and oncologist discussed at length what she might do at this point and decided that she would like to talk with a palliative care doctor about all the options that she had 
in particular wanted to explore, from my perspective, what value for her would an experimental therapy that was being offered at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, uh, a type of bone marrow transplant. So just keep all that in your mind as I go forward. So one of the big challenges is if you imagine you were, you were Jane coming to see me, or you are someone with a serious illness that we don't have very many good treatments for, anyone you might imagine from your experience, the first question that uh, comes to my mind is, how do I know that it's appropriate to talk about the fact that you might die from this, and we should be talking not only about curative treatments, but about palliative treatments that might help you live your life in a different way. How do I know that that's appropriate? What kind of trigger, what kind of benchmark do I need so I know that this is a discussion that probably we should consider having? I'll just tell you, if you look at the research, for most doctors, the benchmark, the criteria to have this discussion is when they're sure that curative therapies won't work anymore. Anybody familiar with the literature of how good doctors are at predicting who's going to die when? <laughs> We're not very good at that. But we get really good at it when you're almost dead. <laughs> so the literature would show that by, if you wait for your doctor to bring up the subject, if you have a doctor who practices at the usual standard of practice, you have days or at most a very few weeks to live before we would ever have this kind of discussion. Now, us palliative care type doctors think that that's too late. Something, uh, so one alternative definition, which I would throw out to you and you might think about would be, well, here's what we try to teach the medical students and residents. When, the, when I'm looking at Jane, I ask myself, if Jane died in the next year, would I be surprised? And the answer is no. Jane has a very difficult illness and of the treatments she has to choose from, the burdens of those treatments actually could cause her death. Uh, the bone marrow transplant in particular, if she survives it, might give her a miraculous remission. But if she doesn't survive it, and there's a significant chance she won't, she could die from the treatment itself. So I wouldn't be surprised. So if I wouldn't be surprised if she died, we should talk about what that would be like and how she would like it to happen. That would be a palliative care perspective. That would move, in the trajectory of illness, move us from the very end to somewhere where, where whenever death is a realistic possibility, we should talk about it. We should move it to months. You know, you're not gonna talk about it. You know, when you first, when Earl was diagnosed with diabetes at age six, probably that would not have been an appropriate discussion. <laughs> but it, as Earl gets older, we'll see when we, when we should talk about it. Okay, and then there's another point. If we agree it should be talked about, how do you do that without scaring the bejesus out of everybody in the room? Or overwhelming people so that it's not safe to talk about. So now what I want you to do is imagine that you're Jane or you or you with someone you love or care about who's seriously ill, and I'm gonna share with you what we try to teach the students. And this is again based on research as well as experience, but this is based on strong research. And the first thing we need to do is set a context. So, hi, I'm Dr. Farber, Stu Farber. What's your name? How do you want me to address you? What would be respectful? And you can call me Dr. Farber, Stu, anything that's socially acceptable. And you know what? I'm, I'm a palliative care doctor. And what I do is take care of people who are really sick. And they've got illnesses where we just don't have easy treatments that we know are going to make you better. And what I've learned taking care of patients and families just like you is, probably the most important question in your mind right now is what's good medical care for Jane? And what I've learned, and I want to tell you, I did not learn this in medical school, is that any treatment we can offer you that helps you live a life that makes sense to you, that gives you value, that relieves your suffering, that helps you be who you need to be, or want to be or have to be to live in this situation, that's good medical treatment and we should keep doing it. On the other hand, any medical treatment that causes you to live a life that doesn't make sense to you, that increases your suffering, that causes you to be somebody or something you don't want to be, we should talk about that treatment and see whether or not we should continue it. You're not going through this alone. You've got family 
And as they go through this with you, whatever is going on needs to make sense to them. So we need, so, so that creates a problem for us doctor types because normally, how do we know as doctors or nurses that what we're doing is good treatment? Well, we have to have some kind of objective measure. So we'll do a test, a blood test, a biopsy, an x-ray, a scan. I'll do some measure of function. I'll examine you. And if you're better, then the treatment's good. If you're not better, the treatment isn't as good as we'd like. As far as I know, and I know there's a giant hole in the ground there at the end of Pacific and University where we're going to do a lot of genetic testing, but even after that building's built, as far as I know, we don't have an x-ray, a scan, or a test that tells us whether or not the treatments we're giving you help you live a life that makes sense to you. So, what I'd like to do is invite you and whoever in your family is going to go through this with you to have a conversation. And in that conversation, we need to explore how you see your situation and what's important to you so we can figure out what will be good medical care for you. Because as a palliative care doctor, I'm an expert at taking care of people who are really sick. And I know all kinds of treatments for whatever Jane might be going through. But until I know what you and your family's goals and values are. I don't know if the treatments I'm going to suggest help you live the life you want to live or are going to add to your burden of suffering and misery. Because you and your family are experts. You're experts of being you and living the life you want to live. And until I know your expertise, I'm handicapped in terms of trying to help you have the kind of medical care you need to live the life that makes sense to you. So. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that doctors don't usually ask. Is that OK? I could retranslate that. I was teaching a course with a social worker who was an African American. And he said in his community, when you ask these kind of questions, you basically say, you know, I'm going to get into your business. Is that OK or not? <laughs> but on the other hand, how many people do you go you've never met before? They ask you a bunch of questions. And they say, OK, I want you to take all your clothes off. I'll be back in a minute. You know, <laughs> Doctors get away with a lot. There's a couple other professions, but they're probably not in the medical. We're not teaching them here at the University of Washington anyway. Um, so the kind of questions I would ask Jane, the first one I'd ask is, what's your understanding of your situation? Now notice I didn't say, what is your illness? Or what do you think your illness is? I'm saying, well, how do you see your situation? Because most patients, there's a few that would say, I have stage four ovarian cancer. I've looked at the genetic studies of my tumor, and I've looked at the scan, and I think that I've read on the NIH website that this treatment would be the. A few do that. Most of those are doctors. Uh, most patients would describe, you know, I'm in a tough battle. I went through this three years ago. I'm really frightened. I don't know what's the right thing to do. And I just really would like some help in making that decision. That might be how they see their situation. Or they might say, I don't want to burden my family. They might say, who knows what. But they'll describe it from their perspective. And it's very important that I know that, what their perspective is. And if they use words like the cancer, it, my cancer, big difference in terms of how they see their situation. And then I ask, well, what's important to you right now that I, we want to discuss and I need to know? And it might be about very medical, technical questions, or it might be, I don't want to burden my family. I don't want to spend my entire life savings on a chronic illness. Anybody here familiar with what the economic impact is of having a chronic debilitating illness on people's finances? One third of people spend their entire life savings before they die. Uh, or it might be, my, my husband has Alzheimer's disease, and if I'm not there to take care of him, my kids are going to put him in a nursing home, and I can't, that's just not right. I don't want that to happen. So I'll do whatever it takes. I don't care what it is. And it's not the disease they're living, uh, to, it's for their husband they're living their life, not for themselves that they're going through this. So knowing what's important from the patient's point of view is very, very essential. Another question I'd ask Jane is, well, what are your past experiences with serious illness? Most of us that are getting older, and unfortunately I feel like, I don't necessarily feel that way, but actually I am in that category, have taken care of others that we love or care about that have died. And in those experiences, we've 
learned many things, and we've learned things about what we would like for ourselves or what we wouldn't like for ourselves. And if I don't know what those things are, again, I'm at a handicap, plus that's how, you're, how Jane is seeing her experience. She's seeing it through her, what her experience is, and not knowing that really makes it difficult for me to help her, both medically and in helping her make decisions. Who are your social supports? Who is it in your family that if you couldn't talk to me, I should go and get information from or help make decisions? Who are the people who are gonna help you through this? We need them in the room too, so we know that what we're doing makes sense to everybody. So what are her hopes? What are her fears? What does she wanna do with the time she has left? And most importantly, what else does she want me to know about who she is and what she believes that will make it, that I need to know to help take good care of her. So that's the minimum expertise I need to know from the patient and family before I have any idea what's the right medical therapy for her. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the characteristics of palliative care um, that, that would allow me to help take good care of Jane and her family. And the first one, which we alluded to earlier, is that palliative care accepts that death is one of many possibilities that we're facing in this clinical situation. And for Jane, she might have a miraculous response to an experimental therapy and have a very prolonged remission or not. And we're going to prepare for all of those, and if it, the, we're going to hope for the best, but if the best doesn't happen, we're not going to ignore it. We're going to be prepared for it. We're going to help her still live the best life she can, no matter what happens. And we're going to focus on helping her live the best life she can, expecting the best, preparing for all possibilities. The unit of care is not just Jane. It's Jane and her family and her community. We're going to emphasize control of distressful symptoms, especially pain. And we're not going to worry about why Jane is having pain. If Jane's having pain, we're going to make sure we aggressively treat it. That symptom unto itself. Often in medicine, we, get, we don't treat it till we know what it is and why it is. <clears throat> Palliative care, you would treat symptoms that cause pain and distress. And then you, you know, knowing why is helpful in directing therapy, but we're still not going to withhold therapy, uh, even if we don't know why. And the last is that clearly no doctor, no one nurse, no one clinician can deliver this kind of care. It really requires a team of doctors, nurses, social workers, spiritual providers working together uh, to support both each other as well as the patient and family. So let's come back to Jane, our 56-year-old who's coming to talk about what's good therapy for her. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. First of all, before I went into all this palliative care, end of life stuff, I was a family doctor and for about 17 years. And actually, Jane was one of my patients. And I left my clinical practice several years ago, but th three, uh, three years before, I was the family doctor who did the routine exam that found her ovarian cancer. I worked with her gynecologist and oncologist uh, through her treatment and uh, she was in complete remission when I left practice. She asked to see me, not as her family physician, but as someone who was expert in palliative care and someone who knew her and that she trusted to help make this difficult decision. And so I asked Jane pretty much the same questions that we just went through just a moment ago. The first question was, well, how do you see your situation? And Jane said, you know, three years ago, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I know that they told me intellectually that this would only create a remission, it would be likely to come back. Only a very small number of people beat this. But you know what? I thought I was gonna be one of those people that would be cured. I thought I was gonna beat it. Now I understand that I'm not gonna beat it, but that there are treatments that might give me a prolonged remission, and I wanna live, I wanna make the best decision I can that gives me the best chance to live a life of meaning given the treatments before me. So I want, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what will give me the most time that'll have the most meaning for me. And I'd like you to help me do that. I said, 
and I'd be happy to help you do that. But before I do, I need to know more. You're talking about living a meaningful life. Well, what exactly is it that you want to do with this time? How do you see that? And Jane lived a wonderful life. She's a great person. And she described a lot of very important, meaningful things in her life. She had a husband that she'd been married to for many years, over 30 years. She had a rich profession, a rich community. But as I listened to her answer that question, it became very clear there was one thing that was really important to her, and that was her 22-year-old daughter. She had a very important relationship with her, and she had a lot of things she wanted to provide her daughter, and she wasn't ready to let go of that yet. So her 22-year-old daughter was going to be graduating from college on the East Coast, coming back to this part of the country for her first job. So she wanted to be there to share with her daughter what it was like to start your professional life and how she could help her in that growth and that development for her daughter and share that with her. And her daughter had a pretty strong relationship with her boyfriend. Wasn't sure if that was the relationship, but whenever that time came when she got married, she wanted to be for, for that, to share that. And then you can imagine, like all of us types about this age, she's hoping that her daughter would get married and have grandchildren. That would be also a wonderful thing. And that was a whole other area. What became very clear is that she became alive as she described this as what she wanted to do was leave a legacy of love and care and wisdom. Us old folks think that we, over the years, have distilled a lot of wisdom for you young people here. And <laughs> my son, I've gotten a lot smarter now that my son's moved away from home than, he was, than I was when he was at home, from his point of view anyway. But that was what was really important to her. So I listened to all that. We went through the other questions. And I said to Jane, well, you know, what's clear to me is that no matter what treatment you choose, what's really the most important thing for you is to leave a legacy for your daughter. And so what I'd suggest, and what I've learned from working with other patients and families and professionals in your situation is, you ought to record whatever it is you want your daughter to know. You can do that, you can write her letters, you can do a videotape, you can do an audio tape, you can do whatever creative way. But the worst that'll happen is if you do that, is if the th treatment doesn't work, your daughter will have this living legacy. And that when she's 22, 28, 32, 40, she'll read these same words, but as she grows and matures in relationship to that legacy, they'll take on deeper meaning. That's the worst that can happen. The best that can happen is, you'll have a great response to treatment and you'll have that stuff written down and you'll be there yourself to share that with your daughter. So my, that, that's my first advice. Now my second advice is, having listened to what you said, having talked to your gynecologist, having talked to your oncologist, having talked with the doctor at Fred Hutchinson, and having gone on the internet and having known your case from the beginning, is that weighing all these options, you ought to strongly consider this high-tech experimental therapy because it has a really good chance of giving you the prolonged remission that you want. The more conventional therapy is going to be, you know what that's like, you've already been through it, and it's not likely to give you a prolonged remission. You had three years last time, it'll give you a lot less when you go through it again, but it will prolong your life. And we parted, and I didn't hear much from Jane uh, until I, you know, you get these notes that come across from the uh, from the uh, oncologist or other consulting physicians. And I did know that she went and had the experimental treatment. And I also knew that she did very well with that experimental treatment and got out of the hospital and went home. And then um, I didn't hear much more until about nine months later when uh, I got a uh, call from her oncologist. He said, Stu, I'm, I should have called you sooner, I'm really sorry, you're going to kill me, but Jane isn't doing very well. She had a, a, a significant recurrence of her cancer a couple months ago. We tried the standard treatment. It was very toxic. She doesn't want to do it anymore, and she's just gone on hospice. So I said, well, uh, I said, well I'm not going to kill you, but I wish you would have let me know this sooner, but that's okay. So I actually called Jane, and we talked on the phone, and I asked if I could visit her. And she said she'd be delighted. So she actually lived not far from my own home. I went, went to her, her house, knocked on the door. And what 
she, she, again, her family wasn't there for whatever reason when I went to see her. And she clearly looked quite ill, but quite at peace, quite comfortable in her own home. And we sat down to have tea. And as we visited and talked about what, how things were going, she turned to me and, and I, I will tell you, this is where I learned something from patients that I never could have imagined. And in fact, learned something that affected me more profoundly than I would know it and prepared me for more than I would ever have known at the time. But she said to me, well, Dr. Farber, I want to thank you. So I said, well, I appreciate that, but uh, exactly what are you thanking me for? And she said, I'm thanking you because you prepared me for this moment. You prepared me to really understand how I want to live my life, given the situation I'm in. And I thank you for that. And I've decided that I'm not going to have more medical treatment in the standard sense to prolong my life, even though that might add some weeks or months. I'm really going to focus on being with my family, especially my daughter, who's taken a leave of absence from work. I've written her all those letters. I now will be able to really talk about them with her in this time. I think this is going to be a very meaningful time. Also, my symptoms seem to be well managed. I'm not in pain. And the team, the hospice team in this case, is supporting my family. So I know that they're going to be supported not only through this experience, but they're going to get bereavement after this, my, my life is over. Thank you very much. So, I appreciated that. I certainly learned the kind of courage and the kind of conviction it takes to live life on your own terms. Uh, it's pretty hard to turn down medical treatment that might extend your life even if it's only for a short time. And I left, not realizing at that time how much she had taught me. And now I'll flip forward. I was asked to give this talk, oh, in January. Uh, and at that time, uh, my mother, who had, was 87, um, we, had just brought, we had brought her home to our home eight months earlier to live with us because she was not dying, but clearly coming towards the end of her life. And uh, actually, she died two weeks ago, which sort of interrupted preparing for this talk a little bit at the time. But um, I really fell back on what I had learned from Jane as I and my wife and my family and community rallied around to figure out how would we, together with my mother, live the best life we could. And I don't know how Jane and her family used that six weeks, but if it was anything close to what Jane prepared me to have the courage to do, it, must, it was quite meaningful, I'm sure. What I'd like to share with you right now is um, just a, a, a few photographs that we took in the last few days of my mother's life with us surrounding her. Um, I'll also, there'll be a musical background. I shudder because actually it'll be me singing. Uh, but it's probably not too bad. Uh, and it's actually a prayer that I sang. And this song is exactly what I was singing when my mother took her last breath. And I'd like to share that, in a, and partly because I want to share what at least was the opportunity that we had because of, number one, I'm a physician who does this for a living, and it's really different to, to be on the sidelines coaching people and to actually do it in your own life. But, uh, but also to share that this is an opportunity that we had because we had a great medical team that came and supported us. And I'm not in any way proposing that this is the right way, but it is an opportunity in each of us as we come to that moment, if we're lucky enough that it's not sudden and out of our control, we have choices to make and each of us have the opportunity to choose what's best for us. And this is one example, but I'd like you all to think about how would you like it to be for you? And do you want that to be and, and that we have control over that, and we have doctors and professionals who would like to help you have that conversation so that you don't live it in the crisis, but you actually think about how do you want to live your life up to the very end until death comes. So um, uh, I will show you my mother. Mm. 
say shalom bim ramon who ya say shalom aleinu ve ya koho yisrael imaru vimaru omen oh say shalom Say shalom aleinu ve'akoh Yisrael imaru vimaru omein yahase shalom yahase shalom shalom aleinu. Yako Israel, Yaha se shalom, Yaha se shalom, Shalom aleinu, Yako Israel, Yaha se shalom, Yaha se shalom, Shalom aleinu, Yako Israel. Yaha se shalom, Yaha se shalom, Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. Yaha se shalom, Yaha se shalom, Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. The other thing I'd like to share with you is a poem by a Northwest poet, Raymond Carver, who um, actually wrote this particular volume of poetry, and this is the last poem in the volume before he died of lung cancer. And I think it really encapsulates the privilege in the, in the mystery and the magic that we shared as a family um, in our experience, it's called Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life, even so? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. My mother's journey uh, included throughout it an attempt and uh, uh, striving to find peace and unconditional love. And uh, the magic was that not only were we able to provide that as a family for her in the last days and weeks of her life, but she was able to give that to us. So it was bittersweet. Certainly it's hard to lose your parents. And uh, my father had died uh, 20 years earlier of a heart attack in a very different way, very different experience. Uh, some people would think of it as the ideal death. He was out playing tennis. He was ahead 5-0, doubles, going for 6-0, and he was gone. Uh, having, ex uh, having experienced what I did with my, with my mother, I'm not so sure it was ideal. I think that this, in many ways, was better, at least for us as a family. But what I do know is we had a great opportunity, and we lived the end of our, her life together in a way defined by what we thought was meaningful and we're blessed to have a medical team that supported us in that. And what I hope we're doing here at the University of Washington with the programs that I'm affiliated with and are helping develop is to make sure that the providers of medical care that you have, whether they be a doctor, nurse, or social worker, are trained so that, not that you have the death my mother had, but that when you come to the end of your life that you have the respectful death that makes sense for you. And that requires less science and more being able to know how to communicate and talk about difficult topics in a safe, caring, humane way. So that's what I have the privilege and pleasure of doing at this institution, and I love coming to work every day. Thank you very much.
there are any questions, I would love to answer them or hear from you what you have to say. First, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing what you did with us. Uh, one, <laughs> our society seems to want to hide death, and uh, I don't know if that's normal, abnormal, or what, but it seems to me it would be helpful in the end to have thought about it a little more through life, and I didn't know whether you thought that would be true or not, and if you did, uh, what might we do to help people uh, address it earlier in life? There are two really mysterious events in the life cycle. As a family doctor, you know, you sort of order your educational and, and experience around the life cycle events. And the two most mysterious to me are? Death. Okay, and I'll tell you, having done, delivered a couple hundred babies and birthed even more into, on the other side, they really are similar events. And that um, somehow for birth, when I was trained to deliver babies, the right way to do it was you took women into an operating room, you put all this sterile stuff on them, you didn't let the husbands in if you could avoid it, and if, they, and if there was any trouble, you gave them an anesthetic. That's how I learned how to deliver babies. Now, shortly after I got into practice, there was a whole group of consumers who said, this really doesn't sound like what the kind of experience we want. This is, you know, having a baby isn't a medical event, it's a human event, and we like to have doctors there because they can make it come out better most of the time. And there was a real movement that, that moved birth into <laughs> something that was consumer, talked about plan, birth plans, etc. And I would hope that somehow we can begin to have a conversation in our culture where the same is true for the, that mysterious event at the end of life where we talk about it as a human event and make it culturally acceptable. But I think we have a lot of work to do before we get there. But I absolutely agree with that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. I know palliative care and what you've been talking about is definitely something that you're dealing with when a person is facing a life-threatening illness. But on the other hand, how could some of these things be applied to people who are living with chronic progressive illnesses, such as, I don't know, neurological problems, uh, Parkinson's disease, but, MS, where they need to make a lot of decisions along the way and they have to decide about the quality of their life and what the, how that in, impacts their yeah. treatment choices? So, so, so first off, just as very practical, there, if you want to go to a website, there, there's some what I would call values clarification or ways of beginning to think about what your values are and how you want to apply them. There's something called an ethical will, and you can look that up in Google, or you can look up five wishes, which is another kind of tool. But, but essentially, the question you raise is, if you have a, there's, there are kind of chronic progressive illnesses where you know we just can't do anything for you, and you're just going to get worse. Diminishment is your future. And a, a, a prototypal illness would be Alzheimer's dementia. That generally is something that most people f find as a very s frightening way to think about their future. And, and in an illness like Alzheimer's, from diagnosis to death could be a decade. And it, as you go through that illness, you'll dis you're going to be diminished. And at certain points along the illness, you'll be diminished enough that maybe you can't be taken care of at home anymore and you'll be in an institutional setting. or maybe to be in a home is quite a burden and you're not as aware or alert. And so as you go through that, and actually my clinical work is I'm the medical director of a nursing home. So uh, I, get a, I get calls all the time where it'll say, uh, Dr. Farber, I have an 89 year old person that has dementia who has a high fever and a cough. And with the stroke of my pen, I can prolong their life. Say, we'll give them an antibiotic, and almost always they'll get better. Should I give them an antibiotic? Well, that really isn't always an easy question to answer. In that patient, at that point in their moment in their life, is that pneumonia actually the old man or woman's friend? Is that the natural ending to a life well lived? Or is there more living to do, and we should treat that? And the only way to answer that question is to have the conversation we talked about. If you've had those conversations and you've thought about it in advance, when you get there, you're not in a crisis. And you can feel in your heart that you're doing the right thing. 
So generally, the patient I can't talk with anymore. But the family, we can talk about this and I say, in your heart, if your father died of this pneumonia, can you go to bed the day after he died, when you go to bed that night, are you gonna feel that you did the right thing for your dad, that that's what he would have wanted? Or are you gonna feel that distress about it? Let's talk about that and find out how to make that answer. So, so I think that, that, that having those discussions and if the patient can participate even the better uh, are very important. So when the crisis comes, you're prepared for it. Thank you. I, I just feel like in today, doctors don't have time to have those discussions. And I'm just wondering. On okay, so you know, again, in my training, happens, what, so the, re what the research shows is when I'm, the, 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 the method of communication I'm describing is called relationship-centered or patient-centered communication. Doctors who are expert at that spend on average one more minute per encounter than doctors who aren't. So it, 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 it's not just that we don't have time, it's how we use that time. We want to thank Dr. Farber for an extraordinary talk.